Hey everybody, Bill and Deb. Hi there. Hey, before we begin with uh, the topic for today, uh, first thing I'd like to say is how much I really appreciate both of us. Uh, our, uh, all the kind and wonderful comments on our last video updating you on uh, our situation when it came to being sick. And uh, of course Deb got over it real quick. I'm going to go ahead and give you a real quick update and then we're going to move on. Deb got over it real quick. Me, I ended up with pneumonia, as a lot of you know. Um, uh, I did finish the uh, uh, antibiotic regimen just, uh, what, yesterday? Yes. And I'm doing much, much better than I was in the past. Uh, I still get a little shorter breath now and then, but nothing like it was before. And when I put on the little pulse meter thing and it shows the percentage of error, I'm back up into the mid-90s. So that means a lot right there. You know, uh, did get to go see the uh, cardiologist and uh, my AFib. Uh, he did another EKG and the AFib shows that it's slowly started. He can see where it's starting to correct itself. I was still in AFib a little bit. I don't know what that means. But anyway, uh, I go back to see him in about four weeks. They'll do another AKG, EKG and then when they'll evaluate things and then we'll decide what kind of treatment to pursue from that point forward. Right. But I'm feeling much, much better. I'm still very weak, and I probably will be that way for a little while. But hey, at least I can function. And the next time you see me, I might look a little more prim and proper. I just haven't, <laughs> you know, when I get in the shower and everything, I just haven't felt like trying to shave or anything like that. But uh, at least I'm able to get up and get in the shower without, and take a shower without gasping for air, you know. So anyway, things are doing much better. But anyway, we had a, a email here a while back, and of course, this is before I got sick. And uh, he basically asked the question. He wanted to know more about how we did the wiring in our trailer, and we've covered video things like this in our in videos in the past. But um, I, I could have went ahead and answered him in the email, but I emailed him back and said, "What I'll probably do is just do a quick video here in the next few days." and uh, explain it better so you can see what we're talking about uh, maybe easier than me trying to talk about it uh, you know through print on email but uh, of course then got sick yada 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 and here we are so i thought what we would try to do is fulfill that promise that i made to this person about uh, the wiring and how we handled it so here we go and we're going to try to cover this fairly quick so it uh, make it nice and uh, easy for people to understand and everything which is not complicated at all believe me but let's start right here at the panel and uh, this is where our our main panel is right here and deb went ahead and painted a mural over that to kind of camouflage it but basically what we've got going on down underneath here towards the outside wall that's where we have the main power coming into the panel from shore power now also when it comes in it's connected which is underneath this area here it's connected to a uh, automatic transfer switch so that when the need arises for us to switch over to uh, uh, inverter power like we've had to recently on more than one occasion <laughs> uh, because power keeps going out over because of storms and what have you well it uh, hasn't in three weeks yeah all we have to do is turn the inverter on, uh, the automatic transfer switch, which is all mounted up underneath here, kicks in, and boom, we've got power. And if anybody wants to know more about how the automatic transfer switch works, we'll put that in a future video, so let us know. But anyway, the panel comes, the, the power comes in here, goes to the automatic transfer switch first, and then comes back on up to here to the panel. And it comes up from underneath and fed up to here. Now, what we did, we don't have a single wire embedded in the walls. And the reason why we don't have a single wire embedded in the walls is because we're concerned, of course, about uh, the fact that when you're going down the road, uh, your, your trailer is a rolling earthquake. If we had wires embedded in the wall, I would be concerned about wires rubbing up against metal studs, things like that chafing and then eventually you know breaking and stuff Plus, like it's that. it's in the wall how do you fix it without yeah yeah demolishing if, if your you trailer. end up with a break <laughs> in your wiring or something like that what do you do you start ripping walls out to get to it oh my goodness so what we did we ran all of our wiring in chaseways 
and we pulled uh, the cover plate down and the containers that we the storage containers that we have to show you how we did it but this is how it goes and it runs all the way down that wall there's a chaseway in behind the header there where the uh, the inside portion of the mini split is mounted and it goes up there of course to power the mini split and what have you um, same goes thing around to the yeah. plug in there right right goes around to the, the plug end of there the um, yeah, of, that, of those circuits. And then right. there's another build out over there, which we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Now, the same is true over here. Uh, if you see this right here, that is a chaseway uh, right there where wiring is coming through there. These columns are also what we refer to as chaseways where wires go up and down through them. If you look right here, you see that I have a uh, receptacle right here that powers the television. Well, the way we fed the wiring to this receptacle is we brought the wire from the panel down through this chaseway again where this step is and then it comes up this column and then feeds the uh, electrical box right there. The column that you see over there is also another chaseway if you will. Some want to call it raceway but uh, anyway uh, we're going to stick with using the term chaseway but you can see also we have a chaseway right there. Now that column, not only do we have 12 volt circuits coming up that way and then running down this way to feed these lights and things like this, but also where that column is right there is where the power comes down from the panels up on top of the, of the, of the trailer. And that's where the wires come down and go into where uh, the brains of the, the uh, off-grid system is, which is underneath the foot of the bed right here. So that's what we've got. We've got chaseways running all along here, all along there, all along there, all along there. One other thing that we need to point out, we also do not have any receptacles mounted into the wall. All of our receptacles are mounted in build outs. Like you see right there, uh, there's a receptacle there. Receptacle there's here. receptacle there <laughs> in a build out. Uh, the receptacles here. All of the receptacles are in build outs. And the main reason why we did that is uh, here again, we don't want to have receptacles mounted in the wall. Uh, you know, the wall is only about that deep right there. And you'd have to use shallow boxes if you wanted them to mount flush, or you'd have to build out medallions so you could use deep boxes. But then again, uh, you know, we, you'd have wires embedded in the wall, which concerns us. Now, we're not saying that everybody should do what we did. No, we, we never tell everybody what you no, should no, do. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. This is just what we did. This is just what we did and how we did it. And so far, everything is great. But anyway, that's the reason why all of our receptacles are in builds outs. Then I can use standard deeper boxes, you know, that would meet residential code. Whereas, let's talk about a traditional RV. I don't think there's a traditional RV out there anywhere that if it had to meet a city uh, residential electrical code, that it would, you know, simply because they use shallow boxes, so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, <clears throat> another thing is the type of wiring we use is what they call SOW cable. Now, SOW cable is very similar to a drop cord, drop cord cable, you know. And it is also all stranded wire. And the cable has worked great. We, we like it. What I like about it is, if you could think about, and we've said this before, but if you think about it, when a contractor is out working on new construction, and we were involved with that at one time, you know, you've got all these drop cords that you, where you plug into the pole outside of the house, you know, and you string your cord out. And well, people while are walking over yeah. it, driving over it, yeah. running wheelbarrows over yep. it. Yep, yep, everything <laughs> in the world. Then at the end of the day, when it's time to pack up... We you, just roll it up and throw it in the back of the truck. Right, and then you throw tools on top of it, you know. Because you're tired. And you know what? You pull that same drop cord cable out the next day and plug it in and it still works. Yes. Isn't that amazing, you know? It, it really is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now consider this too. The power cables, the shore power cables that you purchase for any RV out there is made out of a similar kind of cable. It's just that the jacket has a more weather resistant, resistant jacket on it because it's exposed to the elements. 
very simple but it is stranded wire you know and it is a drop cord style cable but with a more refined uh, jacket on it because it's exposed to the elements all the time so there you go that's why we use that now if we were to ever build another one huh only when the divorce is final if, if we were able to build another one yeah i would probably look although this cable has worked fantastic i have no complaints with this sow cable up here at all but probably what i would look into uh the next time around would be a uh, marine uh, stranded cable and uh, the reason why i would look into the marine stranded cable is the jacket on it of course is you know designed for marine use for one thing but also the jacket is more of a flat jacket instead of a round fat jacket like that it's more of a flat type jacket like that which resembles um uh romex wire you know very similar to romex wire what i can see with that is because it is wider and flatter it'll make it a whole lot easier to fit in standard uh, receptacle boxes and things like that and uh, it'll uh, fit tighter and flatter up against the wall than this stuff does but that's the only reason why i would consider that okay now one more thing though that i have not done that i will do and you should consider this too if you use a, a stranded type wire to wire your your trailer is to well, anywhere you make connections like at a breaker panel or at receptacles and things like that depending on what time of ter what type of terminal is on your receptacle that does make a difference but anywhere where you make connections consider using what they call ferrules and what a ferrule does it uh, slips over the uh, end of the wire and you use a special crimping tool and then it basically turns the end of that wire that you have already stripped uh, into very similar to a solid wire what happens is when you go to put the stranded wire say up to a breaker and then you tighten the screw down on the breaker you know and it's got a little nut in there or a little bolt that uh, smashes down against that uh, against that wire it tends to flatten it out and then over time through vibration and things like that i can see this happening where you know it's going to start getting loose in your connection and you probably get a better connection if you went ahead and put ferrules on everything what is a ferrule well here's what a ferrule does and here's how you do it all right <laughs> what is this dear that is a crimper what kind of crimper ferrule a ferrule crimping tool this is a ferrule is a ferrule and uh, this is a ferrule kit you can get and it'll have various sizes to fit uh, wire all the way up to uh, number 10 gauge and then on down to oh I don't know a lot smaller than that but anyway um, this is what a ferrule does this is stranded wire right here Num this is 10 gauge by the way and you slide the ferrule after you've trimmed it properly and I think that's the wrong end this is the end here because you want to get it you want to get it when you slide it on over that see how the end of the wire is just right up to the end of the the tube there and then of course you take your crimping tool and you slide it over the ferrule like that get it up here you can see it slide over that and then you just simply crimp it down like that and now you've turned that into a nice flat rigid as if it was a you know solid core uh, 10 gauge wire so that it won't tend to flatten out when you put it up to terminals like on a breaker or something like that but anyway that is how a ferrule works and you can get ferrules that'll go all the way up to uh, six gauge wire which we happen to have as the wires coming into the panel the main service coming in is six, six gauge wire however this particular crimping tool will only fit down to a number seven ferrule 
or seven gauge ferrule. So what I'm going to have to do when I get ready to put ferrules on my main wires coming into the panel from the service, uh, I'm going to have to get the next size up crimping tool. Isn't that awesome? That is just awesome. <laughs> anyway, so that's how a ferrule works right there. All right, now another thing that I want to point out is uh, the way we did our DC currents. And uh, I didn't look at that real close, but uh, you can see how our lights are coming in here like this. Now what we did when we built these shells, they're built kind of like on a ladder type affair. And we have a false floor that lays in here on top of these rungs, if you will. And then we stack our, uh, you know, our containers, the storage containers on top of that. Now, once that, um, once that um, false floor is there, we still have a lip that sticks up about that high on the front right here that keeps the containers from, you know, sliding out. And, uh, but that's how we did that. And you can see also where we drilled holes through those rungs to run the wires that feed these lights right here. Now, what we also used in order to hook these lights up, which made it so simple and so easy, was a uh, connector called Wago Connectors. Now, the guy that put me on to Wago Connectors and onto the marine wire is George with Humble Road. He's the one that put me onto that. If you've never watched Humble Road, you need to go look him up and start watching him. Uh, the guy builds custom vans up in New Jersey. And in my opinion, he's a genius, absolute genius. Um, but anyway, that's where I got the idea to start using Wago connectors. And that's where I got the idea, if I was to ever build another one, to use the marine type stranded cable. And he runs that cable throughout the whole conversion the whole conversion right there so anyway that's where i got those ideas how does a waggle work this is how a waggle works this is a waggle connector there are countless videos out there where they've tested these things uh forcing extra high voltage each through them and all kinds of stuff and they have come out really really well they've serviced really really well uh, it's getting to where more and more people are using them. Now, there's two different part numbers you can get. <clears throat> One part number covers 10 gauge down to 20 gauge. Another part number covers 12 gauge down to, I think, 16 gauge. Um, in our trailer, because we did the largest wire we use in any of our circuits or anything like that is 10 gauge. So we bought the part numbers that will go from 10 gauge down to 20 gauge and that way it'll still fit a multitude of things now you can get these and uh, I call this a 3z because it has three ports on it you can see the three ports there um, you can and I call that a 3z you can get them in 2z's 3z's 4z's maybe beyond that but I think 2z's 3z's and 4z's as far as you can go but what's cool about it let's say if like on our uh, LED lights that we have in our shelves we can simply bring the main power in to one port. On the other end of it, we can let the power go on to the next light. And then we can come out of the center and feed power to that particular light. If we ever have to service one light and that's it, all we got to do is pop the lever on the one wire that's going to that one light and it does not interrupt all the other lights down the line that are on the same uh, uh, DC current. So that's what's cool about them. We also uh, use these in some of our AC currents as well. They're really neat when, you're, when you've got uh, two sets of wires coming into a uh, receptacle box and uh, you know, you've got to tie your grounds together. You bring, uh, you go ahead and make up a little short jumper wire and go ahead and crimp a, a fork on the end of it for your ground and then you bring the ground in and then take the ground back out so it'll go on down to the next receptacle in that circuit. And this saves a lot of space inside the box. So that's what's cool about that. This is how WAGO works right here. You lift up these levers. You simply 
slide the wire in to the port like I did right there snap it down like that and it's there there it is makes contact and what's neat about these two is you can if you ever tried to uh, twist a solid wire with stranded wire you know that that don't work but with these you can mix solid with stranded and you know still have a good connection and that's what's cool about these wago connectors available on amazon and i noticed that they're carrying them now at some home, de home depots so there you go so anyway uh i hope this helped you a little bit uh here again we want to stress that we are not saying that you should do it the way we did it never we're just simply telling you how we did it and there's a couple things now that i need to do that i hadn't thought about before you know like ferrules and things like that on many of my connections so always keep that in the back of your mind uh, we're going to continue uh, doing little ditties like that as long as people want to know more now uh, if you want to know uh, what part numbers to look for on the wago connectors just say that in the comments and i will give you the uh, the link to the part numbers that you need but while i was looking at them this morning i found out that now home depot carries a lot of them which they hadn't in the past no we used to have no. to always order them right so anyway that's the video that's the explanation here again you don't have to do what we did we just tell you what we did and why we did it the rest is up to you because you got to do what works for you. Exactly. <laughs> this is Bill and Deb with I Ride Tiny House Adventures. You know exactly what we're going to say. Well, we're not camping. We are living. Y'all get out there. Do some living. We'll see you again soon. And I'm feeling a little bit better each day. And thank you for encouraging me. You guys are wonderful. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.